Thanks very much, Jeff. I, we've got about 20 minutes at this current for, for discussion. I'm going to ask Terry and Dennis to come up here and Jeff to stay in part because I don't know if we've ever had these three people at a table together before and not sure we ever want it to happen again. Um, I trust there's a lot of questions. I'm not going to ask mine. I'm going to be totally arbitrary in, in the order in which I, I pick people, but I'm going to start with Brent and then go to Vivian. Thanks, everyone, for their talks. Um, and, and Jeff, thanks for going through all your work. I, I, the, the microbial wasteland is, is a really interesting theme and hel helpful work to find. I have two, two questions for you. That um, The first is just sort of methodological, and maybe we can talk about it later. Are you, when, on your wedding, uh, on these coupons, are you worried at all about um, not repeating sampling on the same surfaces? Are you worried about like uh, di different distributions of natural inocula? And, and so therefore, you know, mold growth occurring on one coupon but not the other. So, so yes, I'm worried about it. We handle that two ways. One is with repetitions. And then the other way is with um, being careful about how we put the samples in the office so that they all have access to about the same air. Sure. Okay. But it's a concern. For yeah. Sure. All right. Interesting. Um, and then bigger picture, more, more importantly, um, on your, could you elaborate a little bit, because I don't know, I don't remember entirely, on the community metrics that you looked for in the office surfaces study. Um, I'm sure there's, I know you did diversity, richness. Uh, did you guys also track like relative abundance of particular taxa and that kind of thing? And maybe maybe ever maybe elaborate on that for everyone. Yeah. So you're asking me about the one thing that probably I shouldn't comment on because that wasn't kind of my contribution, but I will. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, apologies to my co-authors if I get any of this wrong. So all those measures you said, we did track a particular. Um, uh, uh, taxa. We also did some source tracking of particular occupants because we had gut microbiome and uh, not just gut microbiome, we had skin microbiome and uh, uh, as part of the human microbiome project uh, uh, associated with, with some of those occupants. So, so we tried to track particular occupants. We also did, um, and this is really the work of, uh, of Greg uh, and John on, on the project, did a lot of machine learning type approaches where um, you trained the, the algorithm on half of the samples and then uh, see if it could correctly pick, uh, for example, what city or what material uh, a sample came from. So the machine learning stuff really was the, I think, the biggest um, approach we used to try and identify the impact of the different parameters. Okay, uh, Vivian, and you know, I said I was going to be arbitrary, but I think what I'm going to do is just jump from one side of the room to the other to help uh, Jenna with her tennis game. <laughs> okay, um, I'd like to ask each of the three to tell me, given fungi, bacteria, and viruses, sort of three things that have been put up as a concern, um, what would be the two things you would do differently in buildings? to minimize those concerns, just to see if you are all going to three give the same answer or different answers. Okay. Could you repeat the question? Yeah. I, so it, specifically in the HVAC system, um, what are the three scariest things for possible fungi, bacteria, or viruses that you would be aware, you, we should be aware of? Okay, so if there, there's always water when you're air conditioning. So if the water stays where it's supposed to stay, you don't have any problems. Um, uh, however, it doesn't. Um, and that's because of, sometimes it's because of design. And uh, in other words, there's going to be cold surfaces. There's going to be cold, cold pipes, uh, whether they're, um, supply or return water pipes or wh whether they're condensate uh, drain pipes, they're going to be cold compare, compared to the um, air dew point. So um, 
if you if you don't pay attention when you're designing to insulating the pipes, you're you'll have water where you don't want it, and. Um, Well, um, uh, HVAC systems are just adjust the um, psychrometric conditions of the air. And so, um, what can I say? If, if, you, if okay, just in general, um, viruses do, do better in terms of better being transmitted from one person to another, right? Um, they, they transmit better, my understanding is, um, when the air is dry because they act more like um, gases almost. They, they circulate around. Um, so um, dry air isn't very good. Um, and um, the, but that's a winter problem usually. You, usually you can't really make the air dry enough in, in summer to have much effect on viruses. Um, so I guess that's, that's one thing. In, in terms of, um, uh, you know, l although I probably shouldn't, uh, l lumping um, bacteria and uh, fungi together, um, uh, it, it's, it's a matter of um, kind of like Jeff said, where, where's the water? Kind of like everybody says, where's the water? Because, because you don't just, you don't just get a, a, a bloom of uh, mold somewhere. You get it because that surface stayed um, consistently wet long enough to grow the mold. And, and so, you know, like I said in, in the beginning, if the HVAC system is working right, you don't have to worry about that because the water, if the water is being controlled right, it, it's not going someplace wrong. But, oh, one thing I should bring up. Don't let the rats chew the insulation on the chill water pipe because that will ruin your whole idea. Okay. Oh, and, uh, and then one other thing is um, on paper, I think it's fairly tr true that no building has mold problems, for instance, on paper. It's all um, after they're built, right? After they exist. Um, uh, in other words, people, people screwed it up um, one way or another. Jeff, is there a scary thing you want to yeah, so I'll, mention I'll, and I'll, solve? I'll answer this really briefly. I think we don't have enough information to be doing anything with the microorganisms in buildings. I think that it would be irresponsible from an engineering point of view to, uh, to do things other than target specific microorganisms and environments. You know, infection control in a hospital is a classic example. But I also think it would be irresponsible to do nothing. And so I think what we have to do is really understand the nature of, of what, what matters to the microbial, uh, what, what, what matters from a health perspective of the microbial community. And we do that by understanding who's there, how much of them is there, and what their functional, uh, uh, what, what, what functions uh, they have and, and, and they're eliciting, what responses they're eliciting in humans. And until that time, I believe what we should do is follow best practices for the things we know about in indoor air quality. Remove sources, control moisture, ventilate appropriately, and you know, clean the air when those other two fail. Any deep fears you want to share, Terry? Deep fears? Not, not surprisingly, I have some ideas. Um, I mean, they're quite different. A virus would have to have uh, a host organism that it was it was in the building with you to make the transmission. And, and we're probably not going to get rid of the family members. But we can exclude the rodents that carry Hanta. 
we, we can exclude the bats and, and pigeons that you know, if, you, if they build up enough guano in the attic, uh, you might get, end up with histo or crypto. So we can, there are some specific disease organisms that we know are com commensal and we can address those with the building enclosure and with the uh, operation of the mechanical systems. For bacteria, um, we didn't see, I had a, a slide of a nice bacterial slime, I think, that I didn't get to show you. <laughs> I, it's really gross. <laughs> Harrier Burge says it's the gro grossest sample I ever sent her. <laughs> so um, the b bacteria really is liquid water for to get really big amplification in, in, in my experience. Uh, and then the there, there are surfaces that are going to get wet. The drain pans in the, the air conditioning system, the, uh, the floor of the bathroom, the walls of the shower, the entryway floor where people come in. And those places, material selection makes a difference. You, we can select materials that are physically hold up to being wet, and we can select materials that provide no nutrient resource for the microbials, for the bacteria, or for the uh, the the, mo the molds, and, and and are easy to clean. Because if we don't keep them clean, then we'll have a film of stuff that they can use as nutrient, probably on that on that. And so those are my my thoughts on. on I've, I've seen a couple hands. I'm going to sweep across the Chuck. Yeah, uh, for Jeff. Um, so the focus on water activity is interesting to me because actually in, in the food microbiology literature, which I spend a lot of time looking at, there are well-developed guidelines for water activity that are permissive and non-permissive of pathogen growth. And I wonder if you've looked at that and you know, have any sense that they may correspond to the sorts of surfaces you're looking at. No, you're nodding your head now. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right that it's a fantastic literature. The food science literature is way understudied, I think, for a lot of issues that are important in the indoor environment, this being one of them. I think that the challenge is uh, the food is tends to be stored at relatively non-dynamic uh, moisture conditions is, 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 is one thing, um, uh, or at least uh, the measurement assumes that. And then the second thing is that there is a series of kind of known microbiological agents that are typically associated. So the food science literature that I'm familiar with focuses on particular contaminants for particular foods. And so the general problem of a wide variety of unknown microorganisms in the indoor environment doesn't quite translate. Yeah. Right, yeah. Diane? Um, this is a question to any of the three of you. Um, while I, I empathize or agree with uh, the importance of extreme conditions, um, I still question whether the intermediate conditions, uh, um, I still feel the intermediate conditions may matter, and perhaps it's the way you're measuring the microbiome that you you don't find much uh, relationship between intermediate building conditions that vary and the microbiome. And I say that because when we used to measure bacterial components, for example, like what Joanne was reporting on endotoxin or glucans or ergosterol um, or mur muramic acid, um, their levels went up and down with the presence of carpet or, uh, or humidifiers or dehumidifiers or air conditioning. Um, and uh, the relationship between the levels of these components in health was measurable. So that's a long-winded statement to ask whether uh, you really think you should ignore the intermediate conditions. Jeff, do you 
I can respond. I mean, I, I think you're probably absolutely right uh, that that there's interesting things going on. All I'm saying is that in this Moby literature, we don't have evidence uh, uh, to, to speak of. And then the other comment um, I would make is that the the extreme conditions offer us an opportunity to look at something where we know the signal is large. And so that's a good opportunity to perfect methods and that sort of thing so that we can start looking at, at more some of the more subtle interactions. But uh, right now I think that a lot of the more subtlety is probably missed. And so let's go for the kind of lower hanging fruit of these big changes. Okay. Quick, quick question here and then we'll go to Mark. So I, th anyone else over here I think I may have the uh, layman's equivalent of the past, just past question, which is that it worries me a little bit when I hear people describe the indoor environment as a desert, because I think about the talk we had yesterday where there was the discussion of all of the microbes that they found in the salt cellar, right? So microbes actually, in the outdoor world, turn up everywhere. They're everywhere, even in the desert. They're in those crazy hot caves. They're in hot springs. They're in places that, that we consider to be really inhospitable for life. So I'm kind of curious about what's that magic thing about the indoor environment that makes you say they're a desert, which sort of implies they're, they're absent. Or, so just, just speaking to that. So, so uh, I might have misspoken, but to make it really clear, I know that microorganisms are everywhere indoors, they're everywhere in the desert, they're everywhere. And the question is, is not whether microorganisms are present, it's whether they're doing something that we care about. And I think that that's where the desert analogy becomes important because uh, uh, what goes on in the sand in the desert is not generally, it's not a lot of microbial activity what's going on in the river, there is a lot of microbial activity. That's the analogy, I think. Okay. Mark. Um, I want to start with a, a statement, that, and um, I don't want to take this wrong, but I, I want to really kind of put my foot down about this uh, generalization about viruses. And um, I want to back up to Jeff's perspective and uh, just say the jury's still out on viruses. The diversity of the viruses are, are nothing like um, we're able to describe with bacteria and, and fungi. And there's pretty rich literature beginning in the 40s coming all the way forward about variable infectivity potential, which is the endpoint measure for viruses of different types of viruses, RNA, DNA, single-stranded, double-stranded, enveloped, naked viruses. So to make any generalization at this point, I think, is about their survivability at different relative humidities is not okay, so I, I just want to put that out. Jury's still out. We need to do the work there. And I think Lindsay at uh, Virginia Tech is starting to get down that path, aerosolizing stuff, seeing how long they last at different relative humidity conditions, particularly with flu. So I, I, I just want to give us all caution in and around viruses. We've got a ways to go on that. The other question, and this has been uh, floating in my mind since uh, the presentation we saw from uh, Leanne in Texas yesterday, and that is the theme here and the lexicon from the building scientists and, and the, uh, the absence of your calling buildings living systems or giving any ecological context to that is, is pretty clear to me. And it's different from the themes that we saw yesterday. And I'm wondering, and your opinion about characterizing buildings or personifying them or making them living at all, right? You're very clear that this is infrastructure with things in and on. Yesterday, I think we had more perspectives of, of some biological uh, entity being in buildings. And, and I, I just want to be careful with that and I want to hear your perspective as, you know, really infrastructure systems people of us characterizing these things as living or green or, or, or giving any biological entity to the infrastructure. And, and it was really stark difference from today and yesterday. So um, I, I want to hear if, if this is just too fast of a question, especially given 
what we saw from Texas yesterday, are, is it dangerous to personify buildings, to give them an, an ecological category, anything like that? So, um, da not dangerous, but not being cautious in in the sense that our endpoint is a public report, and given the setup that we had yesterday from Texas, I I want to be careful with how we do it. So dangerous is the wrong word. I don't think anybody's going to get hurt by it, but anticipating a public endpoint here. Well, I, again, not surprising that I have some thoughts. <laughs> um, I, I have always thought about building as buildings in terms of ecological communities. I, I uh, and I believe that and I urge the committee to think about them in that same way as collections of organisms uh, living in a, 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 a physical, chemical uh, structure that, that they're actually impacting. And, and the, as, I, as I said when I was giving my talk, um, the, the macrobiota are, are providing a, a richness to that. I frequently find buildings occupied by rodents and uh, um, bats and, and by um, insects that are are providing habitat for microorganisms, but per, and, and and particularly for the mites that are kind of in between macro and micro. Uh, so so I urge you to think those ways, and, and I would urge you to consider projects that are looking at the nutrient flows and the energy flows within those micro communities, be, because that's the ecology. Uh, um, I, in graduate school, I, I, I had several courses in forest ecology and freshwater ecology, so I'm, that's, my, that's my training and experience, is to think about ecological communities and make Dobenmeyer plots and key everything out. So I, I'm, I think I'm in complete agreement with you. Is, does that sound, sound right? Yeah, well, I think that that is the way to think about these. And, and I, I have not actually seen much yesterday that spoke to the transactions between the organisms and their indoor environments. I, I, I saw lots of uh, genome studies. I saw a list, I saw a taxa. That's what I saw. So I'm, I'm waiting. I'm excited about what you guys are going to tell me about the transactions between the organisms that occupy buildings with us and the substrates that we provide for them. Does that help, Mark? Kind of. I can show you some beautiful photographs of it. But I can't bring them up. <laughs> No, that's right. I think it is a useful construct. Yeah. I, I think it I think it exists in, in that way. I mean so histo and plasma the plasma they, they, they don't they don't grow on really on the guano. They, 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 they grow when the, when the guano degrades building materials enough so that the histo and pla plas plasma look like, think it's dirt. They think they're soil organisms, man. But we're making dirt in our attics and they grow there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, Diane walked out, but comment from Diane and Catherine and then, <coughs> did she come back? Okay, and, 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 and Mark's question, um, brings up the point to me that there's a difference between doing good science within the limits of funding and practicality and so on. And I think Jeff does building science as well as it can be done, but Jeff knows I have a lot of comments about the incompleteness of what he's doing because in order to do good science, he needs fairly clean new pieces of wallboard and and I think what Diane's comment stimulated me to think about is that buildings age. 
and most of the, and I've done a lot of work on emissions testing, and we require brand new samples just manufactured, bagged, and protected in terms of their exposure to the environment before we put them in the chamber where we do the emissions testing because we want to be able to compare them. But in fact, I think I may have said this earlier today or sometime recently, that you go into a brand new building and you might smell chemicals. You go into an old building and you'll smell mold. Well, there, there are reasons why. The chemical emissions decay, and over time, there will be moisture in the interstitial spaces, and there will be mold growth. And, and that's just a, a fact of life. And, and I think when, when Dennis asked Bill Fisk, who doesn't have any children, how to deal with infectious diseases, I think about people with children crawling on the carpet who will be more exposed to what falls out of the air. Uh, and, 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 and so the literature, it's old literature, shows very different effects of relative humidity and temperature on various bacteria. And the sweet spot for some bacteria is death for others. And, and so there isn't a right relative humidity to avoid infection. You would have to know what is the epidemic it's organism specific, and then probably we need some updated work on the ideal conditions. Um, and, and organisms vary so widely in terms of their tolerance of varying conditions, and, and, and Mark brings up the viruses, which evolve very rapidly, and the ones that survive are the ones that could tolerate the conditions that we brought about to try to get rid of them. So, so, so let me try to turn this into a question. I coined the term building ecology in 1979, and I didn't know anything about microbiology. Since I've learned a little bit about it, I've come to understand that the term is a really good term to understand, to try to, to apply to understanding buildings. But, but, but Jeff, what would it take to deal with the concern about the aging of buildings and the diversity of materials. You've heard me. I mean, you and I have talked about this many times. Not all gypboard comes from the same plant or has the same. I mean, you identified, you know, because we talked some of the various. Some, what would it take to really explore both the variation in the materials in the real world, including the time factor and the exposure factors that occur in real buildings? from a scientific point of view. And so my perspective is Sloan has spent a huge amount of money on sequencing uh, DNA or RNA, but very little money understanding the building environment in which those things occur. And, and, and as this committee goes forward, I would like us to at least contribute our ideas about how to amplify the scope of the science to include those things that have been excluded to date. Yeah, so I'm going to try and give an answer uh, to that question, and, and I'll try and do it briefly. I mean, the answer is, of course, how much money are you going to give me to do this research? But, uh, uh, but uh, I think that some of what we need to do is the really controlled type of stuff. So, for instance, take a manufactured home. This is something we were talking about uh, in our group earlier in the breakout session. Take a manufactured home that came from the same factory at the same time, bring them to some microbial base state, uh, and then put them to different parts of the country, unoccupied, see how the microbial community develops over time. Then you get at the issue of how does place matter in an unoccupied building. And then you do the very controlled experiments about with occupancy, with ventilation system, with HVAC system, with building materials, and time, and you see what happens. But I guess I would argue in the short term, and the, one of the points of my talk is that in the short term, I think that we could spend, that would probably be $100 million, you know, roughly, to do something like that in a reasonable state. I think that right now, in terms of practical guidance for people, where we're interested in is these extreme events. And so from a resource allocation perspective, 
there's a little bit of a difference of what I would do to answer some very pure scientific questions and what I would do to answer the application questions. get discussed. And if we're talking about a trade-off between one more day of X number of soldiers in Afghanistan versus all the infections or all the coronavirus or, or whatever, asthma in America, we start comparing those kinds of ways to spend money, I, I would hope that at least a discussion could start about that. Okay, I'll take an aircraft carrier worth of funding. <laughs> the hospital project, um, you said it'll never happen because, you know, the budget won't get approved. But Jack was amenable to it, and Paula was amenable to it, and you and Brent got brought into the project. And so you, know, you have to make the proposal. point. I, I don't see, and we're a little over time, I don't see Joan or Katie glaring at me. Except up to you. I mean, should we wrap up now or, or wrap up at 1230? So I don't want us to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? And I've, I've just been seeing some emails from some colleagues in Europe that must have been tuning into this. And um, they're saying, we've been studying biomass for an awful long time. There's, there's a lot of work that's been done in the indoor environment in relation to health and maybe just with the old mechanisms of studying it. but we, Somehow we need to go back and take hold of what is known instead of just going from what the new people working on the microbiome have done in the last 10 years and incorporate it into what the committee, to the committee says. And, and, of course, don't forget health. Um, I mean, I think Jack was saying yesterday that we need epi studies and... We've, we've had a lot of epi studies in the past, but maybe not the right tools to understand everything. So, but let's, at least in this report and the background and everything, pay tribute and glean from what was known in the past. I just want to have a really quick response to that. I think that's absolutely correct. And I would point out that if you talk to a lot of people who have been practicing in Europe, the moisture is more important than the microbiology to many of the practitioners. I, we'll go ahead and then I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll close it out, I think. Hey, I'm <clears throat> Ed Light with Building Dynamics, and I want to encourage Jeff with your basic science examination of wet materials. This can really, maybe fairly quickly, help us answer some very practical questions we have out in the field. Uh, for example, the use of uh, moisture-resistant materials, particularly drywall, what's the uh, role and benefits of that? Uh, what should the role of disinfection be in the drying process for wet materials? What should be our goal for drying out wet materials? Uh, also on the uh, HVAC side, how much excursion of elevated humidity conditions can we tolerate? And we've uh, recently published a paper with ASHRAE Journal on conditions in summer air conditioning in schools leading to mold growth. And uh, as we understand the, nat the normal background under wet and dry conditions, uh, we can maybe begin to have some uh, actually evidence-based answers to these questions. Um, before I thank the speakers, I, I, uh, here's an observation. The, uh, a lot of what we've heard about this morning, you know, is stuff we've talked about kind of in the indoor environment field for a long time. It has nothing to do with the 
you know, microbiome, you know, keeping materials dry, keeping, you know, using filtration, bringing out their air into the building, managing airflow through walls and through buildings, you know, dealing with the liquid water, keeping out the critters. That's all good stuff to do. And I, I'm kind of left with a question, you know, how do we look at that differently in the context of this study? And so I, I and I don't have an answer to that, and we don't have time for anyone to answer that. So I will thank Dennis, Terry, and Jeff for their remarks today and their thoughtful points and discussions and look forward to more of the same. Thank you. So, uh, so again, thank you so much to all of the, the speakers and to the participants and to the committee members who have um, hung in for some really interesting discussions over the last um, day and a half. And also thanks especially to folks who have been um, watching remotely. Um, I know some people have been sending their comments to our uh, studies email, which is builtmicrobiome at nas.edu, um, and that will get to the committee as well. Um, I, I don't particularly have a lot of um, words to, to conclude other than the thanks, but we're, we're basically wrapping up the public um, component of this, of this meeting. And then the NAS um, study committee has um, a couple of hours of just closed discussion. Um, so I think we, let's take a, a break. Um, we can say thanks again and to, to the folks who are not on the study committee for participating, and then we'll gather the members of the study committee for some um, additional discussion to figure out how the members of the committee are actually gonna tackle these challenges. And since we've heard both a humongous amount of material and also um, how complex it is. So thank you again to everybody and we'll reconvene with the committee members in about uh, 15 minutes or so. Thanks. Thanks.